It is my honor and my pleasure to introduce to you Jean Durning and Joan Singler, the authors of Seattle Black and White. Um, and uh, they're going to do a quick presentation for you. And um, I'm going to sit down and pop their slideshow in. So here we go. Good evening. Um, my name is Joan Singler, and I am one of the four authors of Seattle in Black and White the Congress of Racial Equality, and the Fight for Equal Opportunity. Um, two of the authors uh, are not here this evening, uh, Maid Adams and Betty Lou Valentine. So tonight, Jean and I are going to share a brief summary of a couple of sections of the book. And because of the focus tonight on the Freedom Rides, uh, I'm going to read some excerpts from a letter that was written by the Seattle Freedom Rider in 1961, um, Ray Cooper, and the complete text of the letter that he sent to us when we were writing the book is included in the book. Um, then when we finish, we'll take some questions, and for those who have purchased the book, we'll be glad to sign it at the end of the program. A footnote is um, appropriate here. In our presentation tonight and in writing the book, we want to take you back to the 1960s and, of course, the language of the 1960s. So you will hear us use the word Negro. And then as times change and language change, we will use the word black and Afro-American. Um, our book is a history of the Seattle chapter of the Congress of Racial Equality known as CORE and the projects undertaken in the civil rights struggle and the many dedicated people who were part of that struggle. It's also um, our combined memoirs uh, from that period because we were all deeply involved. Nonviolent passive resistance has proven to be a powerful force for change. Um, Gandhi proved that in India's struggle for independence. Rosa Parks proved that when she refused to give up that seat on the bus. Uh, North Carolina Negro students who were waiting at, and sat at a lunch counter until they were served proved that. And core freedom riders in Anniston and Montgomery, Alabama proved that when they endured the firebombing of their bus and the beatings that they received trying to integrate the bus stations across the South. With the burning of that bus and the horrendous beating suffered, and you saw that in the film, the question was, would the Freedom Riders continue? James Farmer, National Director of Corps, was not ready to back down. He caught the attention of Americans and asked for their involvement to continue, not retreat from this challenge. Students answered this call to action, as did hundreds of citizens, clergy, doctors, lawyers, artists, housewives, people from all walks of life who were willing to risk their personal safety and became freedom riders. The challenge to join this movement and become a freedom rider was heard here in Seattle by Ray Cooper, a 19-year-old white art student. He had his own challenge, however, and that was he had no way of getting to the South. At a chance meeting with a small group of people, including myself, a plan took shape. We would raise the money to get Ray to the South. So right now I'm going to um, read a couple of, um, of Ray's, uh, paragraphs from Ray's story. The core chapter in New Orleans was uh, conducting training classes in the practice of nonviolence, civil disobedience. Gathering in New Orleans, we were getting to know one another, bonding to find the courage to act together. There was a wave of volunteers and we had the moral advantage. I could not have continued past New Orleans if there had been a meager turnout. Strength in numbers. Was I frightened? Yes. But like the others, I was calm and focused. We finally headed for Jackson and sang freedom songs from the long struggle, crafting new words to suit our campaign. We arrived in Jackson. Police and their vans surrounded the terminal. 
They watched passively as we walked into the white only waiting room. Once inside, we sat on the available benches together with arms locked. The police ordered us out. We declined. Threatened with arrest, we went limp and were dragged from the Greyhound bus station by our feet and loaded into paddy wagons. We were booked for unlawful assembly and entered the jail of Jackson City and County. We were, of course, segregated by sex and race. The standard length of incarceration was 45 days, first in Jackson and ultimately at Parchman Farm, Mississippi State Penitentiary. All summer long, the buses kept arriving with more Freedom Riders. Our plan to max out the jail facilities was working. What a relief. At Parchment Farm, it was three men in a two-man cell, and we alternated by sleeping on the cement floor. The summer heat was intense, the food was poor, and time stood still. The routine was dull, summer just crawled in the Mississippi heat. We made chess men from Wonder Bread, practiced yoga, and took cooling showers. There was nothing to read, and I slept a lot. On Sundays, a rabbi from Jackson, uh, from Jackson Mississippi held um, interdenomination services. Of course, we were all Jews. The guards laughed and said they expected we were. The rabbi did this service and interjected relevant news concerning the world and national events, as well as related to our legal situation. This he did against regulations. Our lawyers were able to communicate somewhat with us through the rabbi. The news that buses were still arriving in Jackson encouraged us greatly. Wonder bread, pork and beans, grits, greens, cornbread, and an egg now and then, and thin coffee made with chicory, and the most amazing scrapping of blackened fried grease. 47 days in Hell's Kitchen. So after um, Ray's confinement, these people were taken back to Jackson, Mississippi, and the black community there welcomed, put out a full spread of nourishing good food. And uh, the last thing I want to share with you is that they actually put on a dance. A dance at the Negro Community Social Center followed. An integrated event in Jackson, Mississippi in 1961. A police guard with patrol cars out front kept order as we rocked on indoors to the hit of the summer. Ray Charles hit the road jack. The same summer, Ray Charles refused to play a segregated concert hall in Atlanta. The walls were coming down. So that's just um, some of the Ray's report. It's a very interesting story. Ray now lives in uh, <coughs> North Carolina. He says the South is not perfect, but no place is. So um, this was the catalyst to start Seattle chapter of CORE. And we thought if um, nonviolence and challenging s segregation and bigotry in the South, the remaining four, there were just four of us, could address segregation and bigotry right here in Seattle. Even though there was an active chapter of the NAACP in Seattle, and they were helpful and partnered with us, we, we really felt we were drawn to CORE's approach. We were connected because of our commitment to the freedom rights, and we believed that if direct action using nonviolence could work in the South, surely it could work in the North. It wasn't long before we were put to the test. So this small group blossomed into a well-organized trained cadre of Negroes and whites that were determined to do something about discrimination in housing, schools, police brutality, and we felt, most important of all, jobs. But where to start? Before I give the microphone to Jean, who's going to tell you where we started, I just want to point out one other thing that's in the book. We, we discovered that during the time that CORE was in existence, 
we were under the constant watch of the FBI and the Seattle Police Department. With recent access to FBI files, including my FBI file, we learned that two informers were recruited from our circle of friends who reported back to the FBI on every meeting, every activity from 1961 to well beyond the end of Corps in 1968. Is this mic on? Yeah. Okay. Um, the uh, the <clears throat> beginning of core, if you can switch that, um, we had to follow core rules. And these were very specific. We would be effective if we investigated to find out exactly what the circumstance was. And we were very thorough about this. Um, we then would negotiate with management when we were dealing with an employer and make sure that the management knew that we knew their statistics of exactly how many employees they had who were black. Um, we then made sure that our um, uh, people who would be involved in demonstrations were trained in nonviolence. We made sure that the whole community knew what was going on and would be supportive of us. So that um, when we started with the, the supermarkets in um, Seattle, we were um, basing it on a lot of background. Let me step back for a minute, though, and talk about the segregation in Seattle. If you were white in Seattle in the 19, well, 1950s, 40s, 60s, um, you almost certainly lived in an all-white neighborhood. If you took a bus or a taxi, you sat behind a white driver. When you went shopping, you had white cashiers and bus boys who would, or, or box boys, who would deal with your groceries or cashiers at a department store. Um, food, uh, the your purchases would be delivered by a white truck driver. Um, milk was delivered by a white milkman. And um, just in general, most whites could live most of their lives without ever interacting with a person of color, um, unless it was a maid in the home. If you were Negro in those terms, you almost certainly lived in the central area. And we have a map of, whoops, sorry. <laughs> that's, that's my next story. <laughs> I'll, t I'll come to that in a minute. Um, you almost certainly next uh, lived in the central area, and you shopped at places that had white cashiers. Um, so that when we got ready to work on um, employment, we started with the supermarkets who had representation in the central area. Um, we didn't tell people which place we were starting with, but we sent out lots of brochures like this, including a little uh, coupon on the bottom. If you were looking for work and thought you would be interested in supermarket work, um, send in this coupon. And we tr I think there was something like 75 different people who sent that in. We trained people how to run a cashier. You remember you still had to punch all the buttons? You had to know how much to charge if something was four for 89 cents. Uh, because you couldn't just swipe it in those days. So we knew that there were qualified, trained employees. And when we um, approached the store that had two large um, stores in the central area and that had a history after dealings with the NAACP, we were in good shape. Uh, that was Safeway. And in our, after all this preparation, in our first weekend of Safeway, we basically shut down first one and then two stores. And lo and behold, management that had been absolutely unwilling to talk to anybody about what they thought was not a problem, um, suddenly called. And within a very short time, we were negotiating. They had not only started to hire uh, black employees, but they had set up a uh, a sort of branch of their employment office in the central area so that you no longer needed to take the bus downtown and then out to Bellevue in order to apply for a job. 
Um, Safeway was not perfect, but they did respond quickly, and then gradually over time we had more response from them. Some of the other places were just really difficult. A&P, for instance, if any of you remember that there used to be an A&P here. There used to be an A&P in the East until very recently. Um, we would meet with, nego with and negotiate with the management of the A&P, and they'd say, okay, we'll hire, and maybe they'd hire one person or three people. And then they had promised that they would continue that. We would wait for a little while. Nothing happened. We would go back and demonstrate again. They would maybe hire another person for a year. Nothing would happen. We had picket lines around the ANP that was at um, uh, 12th and where Union and Madison joined um, for, golly, I think it was three long, very rainy winter months, <laughs> cold, rainy winter months. And um, again, the ANP said they would sign something, or they, they signed an agreement, and almost nothing happened. So after years of frustration, we decided it was time for um, another project. Forgot to show you the pictures of the ANP, um, but this was our general sign: "Don't shop where you can't work." Got lots of community support from that. Um, and then we were picketing at the ANP. You notice a fairly empty parking lot. Um, <laughs> but after all these years of stop and go and nothing really happening, we decided we needed another tactic. We still were going to be respectable, we were going to be nonviolent, but we were going to catch their attention. We called it a shop in. We trained our members and on a particular day, we went in ma en masse to the, um, to the supermarket, to the A&P, and everybody filed in, picked up a, a shopping cart, and walked around the aisles, putting things in the shopping cart that were par not perishable, because we were not going to cause damage, but that were very small, and that would take a long time to restock the shelves. Lots of different kinds of baby food. Anchovies, little pickle jars, uh, <laughs> Uh, shoe polish, lots of different kinds of shoe polish that would need to be put in different places, all this sort of stuff. And um, eventually the um, supermarket front was absolutely jam-packed with carts waiting to be restocked, uh, restocked and legitimate customer, their normal customers were unable to buy any, uh, get any carts. I, I guess I should say that um, as each shopper of whatever color and whatever age and what, whichever um, gender walked up to the counter, they'd wait until their things were all rung up. And then, again, this pushing the buttons one by one, um, and then decide, I don't like the hiring policy of this business. I decided not to buy these groceries. Um, it was legal, and lo and behold, it was effective. A&P started to hire, and in a very short time, they had um, uh, black employees in all of their um, stores in the Seattle area. But it took this kind of creative, imaginative way of approaching things. Um, we undertook um, uh, negotiations with a number of downtown department stores, and you can read all about them in Chapter 3. Um, the, the largest, the one that uh, inspired this particular march, was against the Bon Marche that suddenly, on the last moment, decided it really could hire quite a number of uh, black employees. And um, we name names in here. You'll find out about Frederick and Nelson's, which used to exist, and Nordstrom's, which used to be just a shoe store, uh, <laughs> and other places. But one by one, employers, we got a few, a handful of, of new employees. What we really were so frustrated that we decided we would take on all of downtown. And so we... Um, started a project that was called the Drive for um, Equal Employment in Downtown Seattle, D-E-E-D-S, Deeds, and spent all fall 
first preparing people and then with roving picket lines around um, downtown shops. We even um, organized, um, got a bus that we chartered on weekends to take people from the central area to go do their shopping in a shopping center elsewhere, like in the university district or something. Um, unfortunately, we um, were audacious, we were naive, and we did not accomplish a thousand um, new jobs, but we did get the attention of a great many people and there was the beginning of more hiring. Um, another problem that we dealt with, employment was, was a big one and we had some successes, but um, as we mentioned, housing, almost entirely in the central area, this is my map, um, one little black dot is 25 Negro individuals, um, almost entirely in the central area, and that was largely because of white prejudices and the actions of the real estate industry and apartment operators. Um, the apartment, there, there are a couple of, of good guys among them, but basically the, um, the apartment owners association and the Seattle Real Estate Board um, were blinded by their own prejudices. Um, there was a bill in the legislature, for instance, that would have um, required anybody to be, uh, you know, would have banned discrimination in housing. And here's what the apartment operators um, heard in a letter from their association. This bill would compel you to rent to non-white persons who could be prostitutes, criminals, and otherwise dangerous to you and your tenants. And unless you could prove these activities, you couldn't evict them. Um, similar kinds of prejudice statement, statements from, um, uh, apart from the real estate industry. There were people who um, um, had other ideas and uh, volunteers from a number of different organizations, first spearheaded by the Unitarians, um, put together a list of any people who had a house for sale that they would be willing to sell to whoever of any color. And this fair housing listing service, we um, publicized, we uh, core joined the, the organization among many others, and um, uh, went all over the central area um, publicizing it. But again, like with employers, one by one housing was not going to be effective enough. We started a housing committee against the um, uh, real estate uh, firms, and um, we uh, had a committee under Joan Singler, who uh, was young mother with pregnant and, and with a toddler at home, like most of us were young people. <laughs> um, among other things, one particular weekend was chosen for something called Operation Window Shop, when uh, we were going to take advantage of the fact that realtors put signs out outside a house that's for sale and say, come on in, take a look, we have an open house. Well, people from the central area knew better than to go to these, but we decided, you know, we can um, band together, give each other courage, and go out and look at places in the north end and the south end and across the lake. And, oh my goodness, the real estate industry went crazy. <laughs> Um, there was an ad in the paper that um, uh, claimed Operation Window Shop has been deliberately planned by a nationally organized group. I just told you who was doing the organizing. <laughs> um, <laughs> Persons who have no intention whatsoever of purchasing a home serve no purpose other than to disrupt and invade the homes of peaceful citizens. We knew a number of people who were planning to come on this weekend did want to buy a home and hoped that they could buy a home um, outside the central area since it was so crowded within those boundaries. Um, the, uh, uh, real the head of the real estate board said, um, there is all indication that a number of people have been shipped in to guide this demonstration. And if they are imported, they won't be too concerned with how outrageous they get. The, uh, um, not only made these statements, most of the ads were pulled out of the newspaper. Those fat weekend newspapers all full of ad, uh, ads for homes. 
Almost all the ads were gone that weekend. Brokers closed their offices. And um, it just was, most of these open houses were canceled. It was a classic example of how their misperceptions blinded them to the fact that there were people in Seattle who believed in fairness in housing as in other things. Would you like a criminal record just because you sold or rented to a person of your own choice? And so the people of Seattle, although 54,000 of them voted in favor of open housing, 112,000 voted against it. We lost by a vote of two to one. And so CORE went back to our previous activities of picketing a major real estate firm. Um, the last um, section of the book, very short thing on um, schools, which is a recurring problem um, in the paper every day. But at this time, um, we were, it's, it was a Seattle school boycott and freedom schools that, um, that CORE, the NAACP, and the Urban League became involved in because they had tried and we had tried for years to work with the school board to integrate the schools and had submitted multiple detailed plans to achieve this. Um, and the district said that their quote wasn't a problem. So in February of 1966, CORE, NAACP, the churches decided to get the attention by calling a citywide school boycott and began to work on two days of a freedom school, March 31st and April uh, 1st of 1966. Uh, what we were doing was not popular, it wasn't well understood, and while some of the churches, especially the Catholic Church, supported our efforts, uh, a group of downtown ministers objected to the boycott saying this was, quote, exploiting children, this would foster disrespect for the law. The answer to that by Reverend Adams, who was a black minister at First AME said, I remind these custodians of the status quo that these schools against which we boycott have been illegal for 12 years and they've never said a mumbling word. Planning for the Freedom School meant acquiring 14 sites, mainly in central area churches and the community centers planning curriculum for kids from the first grade all the way through high school, and recruiting hundreds of volunteers. I'm going to, uh, well that was done in 42 days. It was an amazing task for, for um, the combined groups. What I'm going to read to you now is normally read by Maid Adams because she was involved, very involved in the school boycott. I was co-principal with a black woman, Frenchie Adams, at the first AME Freedom Schools, grade one through six. Um, March 31st, to our amazement and delight, eager children came bounding up the steps of first AME an hour early, two thirds of black and one third white. Freedom Schools were filled to overflowing the first day with more than 3,000 attending. The boycott was an overwhelming success. This is a shot of Roberta Bird at the YMCA school. The day included Negro history, science, stories, music, and art taught by volunteers, black and white, and from the community such as Henry Siegel, who was the concert master of the Seattle Symphony, and uh, here's a shot of Mike Rosen, who was um, director of the ACLU talking to some high school students probably about the law and civil rights. We went home, we the teachers, went home jubilant, came back the next day to do it all over again, and even more students showed up, nearly 4,000. We were rewarded by comments from parents, such as a mother who reported her children came home with a new sense of pride in being Negro and a new knowledge of the part that Negroes had played in America. 
Absenteeism in Central Area Schools was over 50%. We had been able to involve 4,000 students, almost 4,000 students, for two days in a peaceful, creative protest that taught valuable lessons in neglected history to students happy to learn in an integrated setting. We sent a clear message to the school board. The district's response over time did include a number of actions we had been asking for. Paid transportation for transfer students, training for staff at receiving schools, inclusion of Negro history in the curriculum, Negroes hired in administrative positions and sensitivity training on race and culture. Later, views on the importance of integrating schools changed with some white parents resisting and black parents tired of having their children bearing the brunt of social change. As we all know, either from personal experience or reports on the number of students still segregated and a, lot, a lack of quality education in some of our schools, schools still remain a challenge. As we know, the world has changed in the last 50 years, but a lot remains to be done. Seattle Core um, got hundreds of jobs opened up, including new categories of jobs. We laid the groundwork for um, outlawing housing discrimination. We um, initiated improvements in the school, but America still has much work to be done. Here we are, 150 years after the Civil War was started, basically, under, uh, in underlying reason, was over slavery. We are 50 years after the Civil Rights Movement was working to end segregation. But slavery left its legacy of segregation. Segregation has left a legacy of racism that most whites don't really recognize. Um, but there are lots of ways. Um, inequalities or, or lack of expectations or inadequate expectations of kids in schools leads to inadequate education, not learning, and therefore difficulty in being employable. Our policing system and our justice system at every level treats people of color more harshly than people um, of my kind of, of skin. Um, we, we still need to work to correct these flaws in America. We, um, we still say that Pledge of Allegiance. We've got to believe in a nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. We end our book, and if you'll indulge me, I'll read it to you, by saying, we hope that this book will not only tell you how we were and what we did to become who we all are, but also inspire all of us to work toward what we still could be, a world of equality. We'll take some questions. We want to thank you very much, um, Joan and Jean. Thank you so much uh, for your insights um, into and for sharing with um, our neighborhood, our community, and the world your book and your words. Um, questions from the audience. Do I have any questions at this point? Um, we are going to move on uh, rather quickly to Ben, but if you do have uh, um, a couple questions for Jean and Joan, um, we'd certainly be glad to take them. No? Okay, great. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, we do have one. Hang on just a second here. Your question. Yeah, what inspired you to, to finally kind of come out and share your stories? What, what inspired you or motivated you? Um, there was um, things being written about that civil rights period, not, not huge books or anything like that, but various um, people were writing about it who were not involved in it, and it was misinformation, wrong, you know, wrong information, and focusing um, all, a credit for whatever was done in the area of housing or employment on like one or two people. And there were like, when CORE was really going in 1963, there were at least 200 people that we could get out at, 
at a demonstration or a shop. And, and so we felt also that a number of people in the organization were dying off and we needed to get their stories. So uh, that's why we did it. I was um, um, helping out as a volunteer in the Central Area Schools after I retired, and I was noticing that um, Black History Month, for instance, lots of information about Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks, but no info. Oh, sometimes it might be Martin and Malcolm, but no information about anything that had happened here. And um, so we just felt like this is an important story. It could have been anybody else who did the writing, but it was us who slogged through it. It was a lot of work. <laughs> the question was, how long did it take you to put this together? Eight and a half years. That's longer than the life of CORE. <laughs> <laughs> well, fabulous. We certainly appreciate you sharing your stories with us. Thank you. One more round of applause. Jean and Joan will be available afterwards to, um, to sign books and for questions after we're done here tonight. And don't forget that the books are available um, back with Tom Steele back there um, for $20, and that includes tax. So thank you so much. I, it is my um, great pleasure to introduce uh, Ben. And Ben Corliss um, is one of 40 student freedom writers who is going to be reenacting this. Can you tell us a little bit about Ben, a little bit about... Um, well, about the program. Yeah, uh, well, um, this is a program that's being ran uh, with, uh, with uh, WGBH out in Boston. And um, the whole sort of point of the program was uh, the Freedom Riders uh, 50 years ago, the whole point was uh, 50 years ago people were out and they were doing things. They were out in the community really, um, you know, doing things like, pe uh, like the people in CORE, you know, out at supermarkets making a change. And uh, people today, uh, the younger generation, when people want to get out and do something, they really just sort of like a status on Facebook or just uh, say that they like something on Twitter. And it's really not the same. They're, they're really not out there doing anything. So uh, what uh, WGBH and, 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 and various people around the country are trying to do are trying to get 40 freedom riders like myself to go out and use social media like Facebook and Twitter to let people know what's going on and to really create... Uh, a, a change all across the society as opposed to just the 40 freedom riders themselves. Now how were you chosen? What was the process like and how did you even hear about this? Um, I heard about this um, event through, um, I'm, I'm a part of what's called the Act 6 Scholarship Initiative here in, in Tacoma. Uh, it's a leadership scholarship that takes students uh, from the Tacoma area and puts them in schools throughout the Northwest as a, as a sort of solid group to help address some social issues and to really be a cadre of, of support for one another. And I heard about it through affiliate um, with them. And uh, I applied, and, and, the, and the application process was, um, was about four or five short essays. Uh, how do you th think about uh, the civil rights movement? What, how would you bring these, uh, the, ch the info that you learned to your campus? What do you think about social media? And I was really interested in applying because I felt that it really, uh, it really sort of embodied some of the, uh, the ideals of the Act 6 program of, of taking people from one area and forming a group and going into a different area to really address uh, social issues, uh, particularly around race and, uh, and, uh, and inequality and access to resources. So what are your expectations for this? Um, what, what do you think you're going to learn or be able to bring back to your community? <laughs> well, uh, really right now, um, you know, I'm not... I'm still trying to process what's going on because it's such, it's such a large event. But at the same time, uh, when I go out there, I definitely want to, uh, the first thing I want to do is link up with some of the original Freedom Riders that are going to be out there and see what, what, um, what was their mindset and, and the sort of the courageous aspect that they had. And maybe, uh, maybe you know, I could pick up a grand or two from them and, uh, and hopefully uh, and bring that back to Tacoma to really, uh, Tacoma and, and, the, and the Northwest in general to really, um, Really get people motivated because I, I feel like um, like a problem with with with, uh, with my generation is, is is sort of is sort of expressed in what uh, in what was talked about uh, earlier with you know you really just like something on Facebook or you just send somebody a text and that's not really that's not really the same so I'm really trying to get people active and, and involved in the communities. So what's the timeline like? We know that you're leaving fairly soon, mm -hmm. and how can we follow you, and how can we learn about your your um, your experience? Okay. Um, well, we I'm leaving on the fifth, and everybody's meeting in Washington D.C. on the fifth of May. So uh, coming up here in about two weeks, 
and um, it's a 10-day trip starting in D.C., going through Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Alabama, Mississippi, and we'll end in, um, in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, and that's going to be a 10-day trip from the, 15th, or from the 5th through the 16th. And uh, the way you could follow is if, you, um, if, if any of you are connected with uh, Facebook or Twitter, you could follow any of the Freedom Riders or um, through KCTS as well. You can um, you can go on to, uh, through their website. There'll be um, there'll sort of be a, a link where I'll be I'll be posting some information, some journal entries that I write, photos, videos, and re you can really sort of have that interactive experience with the Freedom Riders. That's brilliant. Now, um, what kind of obstacles do you think you'll come across? Do you think there will be many? Um, I definitely think that there will be obstacles, uh, maybe not the same obstacles that the original Freedom Riders went through with, uh, you know, firebombing and getting shot at and stuff like that. Uh, at least I hope not. <laughs> but, uh, but at the same time, you know, uh, I think that the biggest obstacle that, that I and many others are going to have to face is um, really trying to open up people's, people's minds. Um, and, and personally, I've never been to the South, so... Uh, that could be, you know, I'm speaking from a, north, a northwest perspective, but, you know, if I go out there, you know, it could be, it, it could feel like I'm back in 1961, you know? Yeah, yeah, it could. Um, now, tell me a little bit about your, your family history. I mean, is there, are there other special connections that you're going to bring along to the ride? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, well, um, uh, personally, my, I sort of have a family connection with this because my, uh, my grandfather, uh, he was actually born, uh, born in the South. In uh, in Mississippi, so it was um, it was definitely um, definitely uh, from his perspective, you know, things uh, and he, and he he is actually part of an interracial marriage, so uh, he actually had to leave the South just because you know that's that's not how things uh, function, you know, about 50, 60 years ago. So um, so from my sort of um, my uh, lineage is directly related to you know uh, segregation and whatnot in the South. Now, what can what can your generation? I'd, I'd include me, but I think I'm a little older. Um, what can your generation learn from uh, learn from the Freedom Rides from from the '60s, mm -hmm. and how can we uh, bring that into this century? Um, there's sort of two things that I would think about in regards to uh, sort of taking something from the past and bringing it to the future to help. Uh, one would be that, uh, like I said earlier, that courage that they had to really, you know, just, you know, sort of face, uh, you, know, uh, you know, bullets or, you know, beatings or whatever just to promote, to promote your ideas and your cause. And that really shows the strength of an idea. If you're willing to get beat for an idea, you know, that's, that's a, pretty, a pretty strong thing. Uh, so that's one. And the second would be the, the importance of remembering. Um, I think that in order to have an understanding of, of where we are as a culture today and, and, and have an understanding of where we're trying to go, we really need to look back at things like the Freedom Rides and really look back at things like the Civil Rights era to really, uh, to really sort of enlighten uh, our current generation and, and, there's really, and to really sort of take from the older generation to help the new generation. Now, have you met any of the, uh, any of the other student Freedom Riders that will be along? No, um, I have not met any of them, but I've, I have interacted with uh, with them through Facebook and Twitter and email and whatnot. Oh, so. fabulous, fabulous, amazing. All right, well, we're really excited to be able to follow you, and I know that um, our audience is going to have a lot of questions here, so I'd love to be able to open it, uh, open this up to everyone else. And I know Jane, Joan and Jean were, were mentioning that they had a couple questions earlier, too. So um, who has the first question for this group? All right, here. So, Ben, is there, uh, what's the official name of the event if I were to look for it online? Um, you could go to the uh, WGBH uh, website and okay. uh, type in Freedom Riders, and it should, uh, it should sh uh, show you, um, it's, it's the same uh, p people who, make, who made the video as well, so. Okay, great. Fabulous. Yeah, and we will link that up to you and have, that, have those links on our site as well. Helen? Uh, ben, first I want to say um, you're really impressive, and thank you for your work that you're doing. Um, I think we all commend you for, for this program. Um, as a young black man living in Tacoma, what do you think are the differences for your generation versus what your father or grandfather lived through? What do you think is the one thing that you'll, you kind of touch on this, the one thing that you'll take with you, but even, even more so, what do you think we still have to work on? Where are we not, after 50 years of fighting for civil rights, what do we still need to achieve as a society? Uh, I think as a black male, um, sort of the one thing that I face is sort of uh, the subtle racisms. Um, you know, it's not, you know, I don't get followed around, people don't burn crosses in my yard, but, you know, 
Uh, there's been times, uh, particularly out in Spokane, where I go to school at uh, Whitworth University, you know, I've been uh, refused service when I go to stores, um, just pulled over, just riding my bike around campus. So it, there's, definitely, um, there's definitely some racist undertones in uh, Northwest society and American society in general. Um, so uh, to sort of contrast that with the civil rights era, you know, um, in the South, you know, you knew who, who liked you and who didn't, you know. So it was it was really sort of blatant and and, and that's sort of um, in a sense that's sort of a uh, it's not uh, good but at least you you have a you have a more accurate understanding of what's going on because you could you could take your situations at face value you know you know this person doesn't like you but you know in Spokane I have um, you know there's people who uh, who have posted uh, uh, obscenities on my wall and now I have to walk around the campus I don't know who it is I don't know who you know who likes me who thinks uh, who thinks derogatory of me just because I'm black. And, uh, and that's definitely sort of a frightening experience. Absolutely. Questions over here. There we go. Right here. Once again, you're excellent. <laughs> I'm just smiling back here. Um, you said you had fa family members that are either, from, either still in the South or from the South. Mm -hmm. um, have they given you advice on things to look out for or things to be aware of? Um, well, my, uh, my grandfather, he, um, he's, he's um, the only sort of family member that I really keep in, in contact with, uh, well, um, that, that I sort of have a strong relationship with, and, and he, he had actually passed a few years ago, so I haven't have been able to talk to him about this event in particular. Um, but, um, you know, so n not any real family ties, but I'm definitely sharing this experience with, you know, everybody that I know and really trying to get as many as people as I can on board, for one, to just sort of network and get them involved with the movement, and two, to really sort of uh, glean some bits of information from them and, and sort of, you know, broaden my own horizons. Excellent. Question over here. Hi. I'm a high school history teacher, and as a person who is motivated to make change, I wonder what advice you would give to young people I teach or other young people who don't know what to do to get started, you know, to kind of make that change. Maybe they're stuck on Facebook and they think about things to do, but they don't know where to start. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that, you know, Facebook is definitely a great place to start. Um, you know, you know, you could link up with almost anybody through Facebook or Twitter or whatever. But at the same time, um, I would prompt them to not have it stop right there. You know, if you find an interesting person on Facebook, you know, try to get that person's phone number. Call them up. You know, hey, you know, let's go out to coffee. Let's go out to lunch. Really make something happen. Um, so I would, I would say, you know, starting at your computer is a great place. But if that's your end, if that's where you're going to end up, then you really need to, you really need to reevaluate and really get out there. Question this way. Um, hi Ben, I would like just—I was just wondering what kind of reaction maybe your um, peers, amongst your peers and um, your classmates um, of all different backgrounds, what kind of reaction have you gotten amongst your people of your own generation? Um, I've gotten sort of a mixed reaction. Uh, some some people I you know I say you know I got uh, you know I'm, I'm involved with this PBS and WGBH program and you're redoing really the Freedom Rides and some of them I just kind of get a blank stare. They don't really know what's going on with the Freedom Rides. It's just you know it's another another historical event. And others you know they they realize the importance of the Freedom Rides and they're really intrigued and interested in you know they're they're the ones that are you know uh, uh, adding me on on. Um, on Facebook, and they're the ones that are uh, 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 networking with the with the WGBH people and trying to get involved. So, so there's sort of there's sort of uh, two extremes, and there's not too many people that are in the middle. But that's what I'm trying to work on. Fabulous. Other questions from the audience? Great. Right here, just a minute. One of our speakers. Um, what are you What are you planning to do with this experience when you return to college? When I return to college, um, I plan on using this experience. Uh, I plan on finishing out. Um, my, I'm a junior this year. I plan on finishing out my next year, and then um, uh, heading off to law school. And uh, I really want to use sort of a, a law degree, or, or um, to to sort of enact some sort of. I'm not sure exactly where, but some sort of social social change. You know, I'm I'm, I'm really trying to be out there in the forefront. Really trying to. Uh, address some of these subtle issues and some of these subtle problems that we have in our society. So I would plan on using this experience uh, with the Freedom Riders to one, um, see what works and see what doesn't work in regards to prompting social change. 
um, see what methods work and what don't, and also just uh, a really networking. And so when I when I come out and I you know I, and I have an idea for a program, I have people that I could say you know I have this great idea, I have this great, and I, and I have a, a group of followers who are with me who are trying to enact the same thing. We're all on the same we're all on the same page. So you know let's make something happen. And I have that that sort of rolodex that I could turn to. Fabulous, and you will build quite a rolodex. <laughs> what inspires you? What inspires you most? What inspires me the most um, would probably be when I see uh, people from similar circumstances like me, you know, um, inner city urban kids who aren't able to, who, who aren't able to get out um, for, because of these societal factors. You know, maybe, you know, you know, they're a brilliant person, but they had to stay at home because of, you know, um, lack of access to resources or lack of access to education. And I think, you know, it really inspires me because, uh, you know, one or two changes in my life and I could have been that individual as opposed to a different, uh, you know, it could have changed my whole life trajectory. So, um, so what really inspires me is trying to level the playing field and allow all people to have, have that same sort of access and, and sort of chances that, that many of us take for granted.